grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Savior Jesus who loves all human life and proves it through his cross. Amen. Now first of all, I have to start with a confession. The sermon you're about to hear was primarily written by another LCMS pastor connected to Lutherans for Life. Now, let me assure you, he gave me permission to use his work. And I'm glad to do so because it's an unusual but remarkable sermon with a powerful point. So I really want to encourage you to pay attention because you're going to be asked to provide the ending for the sermon. So listen carefully indeed. The text upon which the sermon is based then comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day, that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of God. Now to start out this morning, I want to encourage you to think about a journey you once took. You probably don't remember it. After all, it was a long time ago. And you've never been back to that place. But you almost certainly made this journey. Nearly everyone has. It was a voyage by water. A, a marine expedition, I guess you could say. Actually, a submarine expedition. When you were smaller than a poppy seed, you sailed forth. You embarked on a cascading four-day journey down a fallopian tube. I know this is strange to think about. Quite honestly, it's strange to talk about. It pushes the envelope on our ability to see and embrace the truth. But this really was you. Now, no one asked if you were ready. You received no instructions. No one said, do you want to be born? It's entirely up to you, you know. And no one showed you how. But you were put to sea. And for the first days of your life, you floated free. Imagine if you had been conscious. They say consciousness flickers in around 24 weeks. But imagine you were fully conscious from the beginning. An embryo, a, a tiny cluster of cells. And you spin and you twirl and you tumble at the mercy of forces beyond you. Now had you been conscious for this, you'd have had to come to one of two conclusions. Either a merciless current is sweeping you away, or a guiding current is carrying you where you need to be. In other words, you would have had to make a choice. Panic or trust. But for now, as a tiny embryo, it's not your choice to make. You can only float. Let the current carry you. It's as if the dial has been preset for trust, as if reliance on a power greater than yourself has been prearranged. At the beginning, you did not have the ability to say no to your own life. For God said yes, and that was that. God wanted you. So God did not put that choice into your hands. Not just yet. 
In fact, God commanded you to be in the exact cadence of the words he spoke in the beginning of creation itself. God said, let there be Abigail, let there be Steve, let there be Martha, let there be you. And it was so. And you came to be. And God saw that it was good. Comes a time, though, when you do, when you must, choose. I've set before you life and death, says God in our text. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, that you and your children may live. Then God tells you how to make that choice. God says, but if your heart turns away to worship other gods, you will surely perish. In other words, the way to choose life is to never choose death. Never turn away from God. The dial is preset for life, for trust, and just keep it there. It's as if your life has been designed for trust. True, it's a, it's a scary journey. You can think of tubing down a raging river. But just keep trusting your guide. Don't panic. Just as he did on the embryonic leg of your journey, the Lord is guiding you still. Just as he did when you were cascading down that fallopian tube, the Lord carries you still. You were created to listen to the words of the Lord. So listen to the one who knows you, who knows your entire journey. But this is how we choose death. We start taking our cues from the impressive powers of our sophisticated world, also known as other gods. Surely you're no longer a child, beckons the world. Surely you've arrived at maturity. You've accepted that there never was a God. So, so take matters into your own hands. You must, of course. You really have no choice. And then we say, well, of course you're right. Uh, the matter is delicate. We'd like to trust God, but with this, we best see to it ourselves. And in so doing... We said no to trust, no to God, and therefore no to our own life. And we broke away from the guiding current of God's word. We chose death. Picture Mary, a tall 26-year-old from Pennsylvania, Already in the sixth grade, Mary wanted to be a nurse like her mother. I mean, she watched strangers greet her mother with tearful gratitude. She watched her mother love them generously. Mary would see that her mother was someone who made a difference. And that's what Mary wanted. So after high school, Mary went to Villanova. And she not only excelled in her classes, she led a campus organization called Nurses Without Borders. And Mary came to see that nursing is more than just the practice of medicine. Nursing, she saw, needs to wade into the inescapable issues of social justice. So in her senior year, Mary began to think God might be calling her, if there was a God, something she still wondered. But she thought God wanted her to make a difference in the world on a larger scale. So Mary then went to the University of Pennsylvania where she got a PhD in community health. Along the way, though, two things happened. First, she realized health care is a global issue. So she applied and was accepted to the London School of Economics. The second thing that happened was Michael. She met her soulmate. Michael received his MBA from Penn and was able to secure a position with a large firm in London. They found a flat there, and Mary flew over to start classes while Michael wrapped up things at home. But the day before Mary's classes started, Michael called. He wasn't moving to London. He'd been offered a job in New York, a position too good to pass up. And the phone call got ugly. 
and Michael broke up with the woman he loved. Mary was furious, of course, and, and sick to her stomach. Sick to her stomach, Mary wondered. Am I feeling queasy because my life is falling apart? Or am I queasy because she got a pregnancy test? It was positive. And she panicked. My life is going down the tubes, she cried. What's happening to me? For half a second, she actually entertained the thought of having the baby. Wait, am I out of my mind? Michael's baby? Not that jerk. And besides, I can't make a global difference and raise a child too. But, but, but wait, couldn't God have prevented this pregnancy? Well, she'd figure it out later. But she'd get that abortion as soon as possible. The next morning on the subway, excuse me, in London they call it the tube. The next morning on the tube, Mary panicked again. I'm on the wrong train, she worried. Just then a Metronet uh, worker strolled down the aisle. Is this the train that carries me to the London School of Economics, Mary asked? You're just where you need to be, said the worker. When Mary saw the worker's name on her badge, Cecilia, her thoughts jumped to the word cilia. Cilia are the hair-like structures which line a fallopian tube. They wave back and forth, kind of creating a current that guides the embryo to the uterus where it needs to be. At Villanova, Mary's favorite professor once compared cilia to cheerleaders for the embryo. Come on, little person, keep going, keep going. There ought to be cilia somewhere to guide adults, Mary thought. And just then, a young woman slid onto the seat beside Mary. Hi, I'm Liz, she said. It turned out Liz was enrolled in the London School of Economics, too. And Liz was easy to talk to. As they walked from the tube to the school, Mary and Liz passed a towering church. Mary thought she might go in sometime to pray. But she must have gazed at the cathedral a little too long. Do you go to church? Liz asked. Almost never, said Mary. I'm a Christian, Liz quickly replied. Before they parted, they agreed to meet for lunch. I wonder if Liz was named after Queen Elizabeth, thought Mary as she walked to class. But that's when it struck her. Elizabeth, in the Bible, that's who Mary told about her pregnancy. Oh, God, Mary thought. Uh, no way I'm telling anyone. How can I even think of having a baby? No friends, no family. And my, and my life, my career, my calling, it's impossible. I have no choice. I, I have to take matters in my own hands. But we do have a choice. Therefore, choose life, God said, that you and your offspring, you and your children may live. You see, the way to choose life is to trust. Don't panic. I mean, did you think human life was going to be humanly possible? It's not. It was never meant to be. It's never going to be. Guiding a human being through the journey of life is possible only for God. That's why the only way to choose life is to trust, to trust God. You see, God gives no one a possible life though the call of God is to an impossible life. Otherwise, why trust? And life was created for trust. At lunch then, did Mary pour out her soul to Liz? And did Liz take her hand and say, I'm here for you, we'll get through this together? And did Mary have her baby then? And did Michael come to his bloody senses and quit his job and fly to London and beg for forgiveness from the woman he loved and open his hand to reveal a beautiful ring and ask her as the snowflake came down to marry him? And is Mary now trusting God for the well-being of her child and for her own education and for her calling and for her entire impossible life? Is that what happened? And was it through this very experience that Mary finally 
discern God's call for her life? Is that how she devoted herself to formulating and advocating for pro-human, pro-life, public health policies grounded in economic realism, global responsibility, and community resourcing? If so, this could only happen through the cilia by which God guides us, the people he surrounds us with who love us and cheer us on, and with his word and sacraments, with the church and the Bible and the baptism and communion. Through these, God nudges and guides and carries us where we need to go on this astonishing journey he has created for us called a life. Do you think that's what happened? Or did Mary abort her baby? Did she believe the lie that even God couldn't find a way to carry both her and her baby on the journey? Did Mary trade trust for panic? Did she take matters into her own hands? And was it after the abortion that she began to slip into that church every afternoon to pray? Oh, oh Christ, love me again. As you've always carried my life, now carry away my sins. Carry them to the cross and, and suffer them away. And kneeling in that cathedral, does Mary now look up at that statue of Jesus on the cross and look at his nail-pierced hands and plead Somehow, that that Christ, that Christ who died for her, could still be holding her baby in his hands. And then was it through that experience that Mary finally discerned God's call? Is that how she devoted her life to formulating and advocating for a pro-human, pro-life, public health policy grounded in economic realism, global responsibility, and community resourcing? If so, that could only have happened because even though every human being, including all of us, have turned away from God in panic and rebellion, God still found a way the cross to carry us still through the strong current of his abiding word and through his pure and amazing grace. Now the two choices are vastly different, aren't they? To give birth to a child or to abort it. But one thing remains the same. To choose Jesus is to choose life. For Jesus holds every life, even the tiniest, in the nail-scarred palms of his hands. So how do you think this story of Mary in this sermon ends? See, today is a, again a different sermon. I'm not telling you how it ends. You get to decide how it ends for yourself. So what ending will you choose? What do you choose for Mary? Do you choose death or life? Do you choose trust or panic? Do you choose following the ways of the world or following God? Today you get to choose the ending because in real life, which is your life, you get to make that choice every single day. So in your life, do you choose death or life? In your life, do you choose trust panic in your life do you choose God or our world you see to be pro-life is to be pro-God to be pro-life is to be pro-trust pro-faith and to truly be pro-life is to immerse yourself in God's word and let it carry you along So what do you choose this day for your life? Life or death? Panic or trust? God or the world? 
What would you have Mary choose? In Jesus' name, amen.